Merry Christmas. Good evening and God's blessings be with you now and always. This is our Christmas Eve service. I'm glad that we can be together in whatever way possible. So wherever you are, may Jesus bless you. May you know his presence and may you feel the reality of the gift that he is born to save you, born to be your good shepherd, savior and king. He who is God from eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this celebration. We thank you that so much of this world pauses what it is doing and on some level acknowledges that your birth means something. Lord, where it is being celebrated by your faithful, we pray that you would help them to celebrate truly and completely realizing your immense meaning and your immense love. Lord, where it is people who are just doing lip service to a festival, we pray that their hearts would be softened to where they would hear the truth and know you and come to know you better. Help people to seek you out and find the great gift that you are. Help people who are even not celebrating you to find you and to be found in you, saved as your beloved. Thank you that you come to us wherever we are at. Thank you that we receive you meekly and we know that you are there with us and we thank you for that great gift, especially in times where we are feeling so cut off from what we are most used to. Thank you for your love most of all, we pray in your name. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. From Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. 
Micah chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke 2, verses 8 through 16. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger.
Luke 2, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Lord Jesus, as we move into looking at the gift and the wonder of Christmas, I pray that you would help us as we have listened to the scriptures to be grounded in your scriptures. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would draw us closer to you, and we pray that you would not just illumine our minds, but warm our hearts tonight, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, this is it. Christmas is here. We've survived it through another set of seasons and seasonal advertisements and buildups and the like. And yeah, this has been a weird year. And I don't know about you, but I am almost left with feeling that yes, I can believe that Christmas is here. And yet, no, I don't fully know that Christmas is here. A lot of the cues that I'm used to are gone. And I'm almost left with Christmas is here. And, and what do I do with that? just sort of like this whole year being weird has left me quite often with a lot of ands and what do I do with all of that? I don't know about you, but it's almost as if thinking about getting ready for Christmas time with all the things I'm used to, it feels almost like this time of year is a bit sur surrealistic, more like a dream than a reality a bit more like one of those dreams where you're dreaming that you're in a place, but it isn't really that place, but you think that it is in your dream, but when you wake up from it, you've been uncomfortable because it wasn't the right building, but it was supposed to be the right building. Whether it's the house you grew up in or the school you used to go to, none of the walls were in the right places. None of the rooms were in the right places. The people that you talked to, they went by the right names, but they weren't right. And it was Strange, and it's a sort of a dream that you wake up from, and only when you wake up do you feel like you can finally get some rest 
from the dream. It's, it's a jarring and uncomfortable sort of a thing. And that's kind of been the tone, I think, for my own experience in this year. And feeling a little mauled and hoping that God can reach down and reach through all this clutter, especially this time of year. And thinking and praying about what even to say. What do you say that you can add to scripture at all? You can't. And yet at the same time, it's useful to get at and to look at what tonight's celebration means. And thinking and praying about it tonight, we're going to look briefly at fantasy, reality, and a dream. And uh, we're going to take a look at that in light of history. Uh, the writings of Tolkien, actually, if you know him, he's quite still, I think, prevalent in the culture, and the Bible. And you may be thinking, well, those two lists, I'm hoping that you're not taking them in the same order each time. And just bear with me, we'll get there. So, fantasy, reality, and a dream. Fantasy, first of all. We don't define a lot of words, and so I'm trying to bring definitions in there. And once again, from dictionary.com, my own personal source of all things linguistic, one step above Wikipedia, which is the ultimate source of all knowledge, really. Uh, the faculty or activity of imagining things, especially things that are impossible or improbable. It's not just imagining. It's not just making stuff up that might be probable. This is about things that are impossible, uh, or at least highly, highly improbable. Uh, and this is an important thing to bear in mind because every invention, every new idea, everything that we have made that has never been made before or done, that has never been done before, has come from our imagination first whether it's something as imaginative as a car or something imaginative as a pink horse that some kid came up with. Why not a pink horse? I don't know. I find that thought kind of disturbing because I don't really care for the color pink too terribly well, but then I don't really care for horses terribly well, so I suppose it's not as disturbing as I might initially think. Uh, or even just as simple as the wearing of fig leaves because when man suddenly realized, ah, I'm kind of uncovered and exposed. What if those leaves were over here and I have a covering, right? This is invention using imagination. And so not all things imaginary are fantasy. Now, fantasy is specifically dealing with things that are more or less, to all intents and purposes, impossible or so improbable in our thinking as to be just next door to impossible. So for example, we imagine how some things uh, might be that are actually impossible just due to physics. And M.C. Escher does a really good job of coming up with, or did a very good job rather, of coming up with impossible scapes where you have different planes of up and down all the way through them, and eh, physically impossible, right? You look at that and it, it just plays with your head. It's kind of fun that it plays with your head because it is in fact an impossibility. And we also then imagine other things that are impossible due to other factors besides just physically impossible. And these are the things that I think are even more wildly departures from reality. Uh, and I have three pictures there. And those three pictures, each one carries a symbolic meaning. You have a shining city on the one hand, uh, a little bit lower. Uh, that shining city is, of course, what we keep imagining our cities are going to be as we build them and what our great hopes are going to be as we build them. And we dreamed, especially 50 years ago and 60 years ago, of alabaster cities that gleam and are utopian and parad paradisical, looking great, looking amazing. And we also have gre dreamed great dreams over the past again, 50 to 60 years at least, of one day humanity uniting and setting aside all of its conflict because we're really going to progress past all of that and we are going to go build. And th that's a picture of someone's imaginative idea of a space colony looking out beyond the, the surface of some planet somewhere out there because the goal is, of course, one united humanity that no longer focuses on conflict with each other is going to be out there in some utopian dream, colonizing the galaxy, colonizing the universe even. And what's going to make all of this happen is the assumption that we're just getting better over time. That in fact, we are seeing progress. 
And there's even a group of people who call themselves progressives, who are thinking that we are just making society progress further and further along. Curiously enough, they're not very good at figuring out exactly what they're trying to get to. They don't have a fixed point of what ultimately should be. They're just assuming change moving forward is progress. Um, not all change moving forward is progress. In fact, if you're already lost, the longer you keep going on that road, the more lost you're gonna get. Um, but there's this myth that the longer people are around doing stuff, we're just gonna keep getting better and better. And I will say to you, I believe that shining cities that don't have people who refuse to work, that don't have people who are caught in vice, that don't have people who are getting caught up in preying on other people, shining cities of that kind where there is no want, where everyone is put uh, to good use and everyone happily and industriously works for the good of advancing everyone forward, and shining space colonies that have that same sort of a hope and all of these dreams and all these wonderful things, this I believe is more impossible than M.C. Escher ever drew. Uh, and some of this is because we at least have some history of humanity taming and working with the forces of nature. We've had successes taming and working with the forces of nature. If we ever figure out how to tame and manipulate the forces of gravity, M.C. Escher's Pictures like this one might actually be some, somewhat real or somewhat possible. You just end up having different up and down gravity senses going on in different parts of that structure there. But the reality is, while we have some history of being able to play around and work with the forces of nature, I mean, we've learned how to fly. We've learned how to fly really well. We've learned how to get things to keep falling at the earth and missing the earth perpetually, because that's all an orbit is, falling down and missing over and over constantly, right? We have history of taming and working with the forces of nature, but humanity keeps running into the same problems and the same foibles and the same frailties that it has as long as we've been writing stuff down at least. Progress is the greatest fantasy humanity has ever latched onto. Don't take my word for it. Spend some time reading the writings of the Romans and the Greeks. Why is it that their great tragedies still make sense to us today? And their tragedies do make sense today. They deal with problems of people having too much pride or people pursuing the wrong sorts of pleasures or people becoming corrupt or people not understanding someone and not giving them their space. All of these themes are quite relevant to us today as we read the classics. Why? Because we're still struggling with and dealing with the exact same problems. We haven't progressed. We haven't done much of anything except continue to go, uh, go along with changes in the backdrop and changes in the toys. And if the backdrop and the toys haven't changed, then what I will tell you is much of what people would call for is being looking towards a greater reality and this time we'll make it happen. Just put us in power and let us pursue this agenda because we are where progress really is. This is fantasy. This is delusional fantasy. This is the insanity of continuing over and over again to do the same sorts of things and trying to expect different results. And if that seems to be fantastic, then interestingly enough, I'm then going to talk about reality as perhaps viewed or presented to us from one of the better known fantasy writers of the 20th century, J.R.R. Tolkien. Now don't worry, tonight's about Jesus, really, and J.R.R. Tolkien would be in favor of tonight being about Jesus because he was a Christian fantasy writer. But he's very, very good in his fantasy that is to say, in the writings that he wrote down, that, that were fiction of, of getting at a, a certain reality. And, and many of you perhaps have seen the Middle Earth movies, at least, based on Tolkien's stories. Uh, the plot goes along these lines. Good people find an evil ring tied to an evil power. They can't use the power of the ring because it's evil and will just make evil happen. So they go to great efforts and sacrifices to destroy the ring. And with the destruction of the ring, the evil power is undone. And with the evil power gone, some, uh, some of those people who had fought remain scarred. Most went on to live happily ever after because the threat is gone and it's never more going to resurface. Now, this sounds 
Comfortable. This sounds familiar. This sounds even like just a good fairy tale, whether or not you know J.R.R. Tolkien. And the reality is, is that yes, this does sound like a good fairy tale. This is also not the story that Tolkien told, if you read his books. Not in the least bit. Uh, in fact, this is what Hollywood took and turned his story into because it's more satisfying to us, because we want a story that's going to fit the myth of progress, right? Here's where we had a problem, and here's how we got over the problem, and now the problem's done, and life is better, and we're moving forward into better times. This gives you a happily ever after ending that Tolkien didn't actually intend people to have. The story that Tolkien told was that the evil that the people dealt with in the books there was an evil before that evil, and it was pushed back by the people of the earth and by others, but it wasn't destroyed. They couldn't get rid of it. The best they could do was push it back, and it came back, and it came back, if anything, slightly stronger. There was an evil that was dealt with in the stories, and it was pushed back again by the people of the earth. But if you read his ending of the story, you realize evil isn't entirely gone. It's just pushed way back for a time. And there will be, if you read and understand where he's going with his story, there will be evil that comes and threatens the world again. And it may be pushed back by the people of the earth, but it keeps coming back. And the principle going on there is as it keeps coming back over and over again, evil comes back a little bit stronger than the last time and good seems to decay and tire out and get weaker over time. And between these two, Tolkien had a very pessimistic outlook that effectively in the stories, evil is eventually going to come back in a way that's going to be overwhelming and it's going to destroy the world. And it's not to say that he believed that all was lost and it's not that he had no hope. He had hope in Jesus Christ. But he had a view of the world and what the people in the world can do that was, I think, spot on to reality. Progress is impossible. Why is progress for humanity impossible? Well, because people are unable to get rid of evil in this world. And why can we not get rid of evil in this world? Because the evil in this world, first and foremost, is our own fallenness. And because it is our own fallenness, it's always going to be there. And we might, for a time, have moments where good leaders help frame good laws that a generation or two might follow as a good idea. But over time that unravels and over time generations rise up and increasingly you get more and more people who are aware of the rules they sort of know what they're there for but they'd really rather follow their own pleasures instead or they get bored with the old rules and they want novelty uh, or insert whatever justifications they give whether they just want to see violence and so they take part in some good sounding but hopelessly misguided crusade to try and change things whatever it is that fallen nature leads to destruction. And we have a tendency to build up, sometimes by coercion, sometimes by corruption, and then the coercion and the corruption, if they weren't there before, they show up in those who've been given power and given money to run. We've seen that as well. A big bill gets sent through Congress, no time to even look at it, no time to even think about it. Is there corruption going on? Yeah, there is. I'm not even going to say what parts of it I think are corrupt. But the human frailty is there. And it will continue to be there. And shining cities and space colonies and all the other things we might hope for, the utopia that we would most want to bring about, they're always going to fail. They're always going to become eventually run down, worn down cities with people who are caught in vice and with bad parts of town where Generally speaking, you find more people who are inclined to prey on you starting to congregate, and then it spreads from there. Why? Because they keep bringing the same evil with them. And we could go to the farthest reaches of the universe and plant a colony with just two people. And within a few generations, we would start to see that same problem develop if we didn't see that same problem develop just in how those two people struggle to get along. Because this is our reality and it's a bleak one it's a harsh one we are hooked on wanting utopia but we cannot have it we will not get it not 
not by anything we might do. So we talk about the bleakness of our fantasy, the harshness of our reality. Let's talk about a dream. That's a little bit more uplifting and encouraging on a Christmas Eve. Those other two are kind of depressing. So let's talk about a dream. Not the sort of dream that happens as you go to sleep, but the sort of dream that happens as someone has a hope and a plan. And that dream is found in the heart and in the mind of God Almighty. See, because this whole universe exists in the first place because of a dream. Because God had a dream. He had something that he wanted to see happen. And so, what's he do? He speaks it into existence. And he says, let there be light and let there be a planet with waters and let the waters be separated and let there be plants and let there be sun, moon, and stars out there to light everything up and so the people could tell the seasons and let there be fish and birds and animals and all sorts of wonderful things. Beautiful location, nothing preys on each other. Everything was designed to be in a very beautific balance, sustained by the good earth that he had made. And yes, let there be people. And people were made in the image of God, made out of love by God, made for fellowship with God and made to rule over this creation that he dreamed up on his behalf. And it was supposed to be a wonderful place and a wonderful role. The pinnacle, the top. Think about it. We had it all, or as much as we could possibly have. And there would have been a clean, shining earth. Not perhaps in the ways we might think of clean and shining, simply because God will design a meadow we will design a granite city. A meadow is in some ways dirtier than a city and in other ways more alive and beautiful and cleaner, I would say, to be in than a granite city. And it would have been a clean, shining earth with everyone safe and satisfied and well-fed. They would have had a place. They would have been loved. Families would have worked. There would have been no sickness or misery. It would have been a utopian progressives dream but we had it but it wasn't something that we achieved it was what we were made for having been made for it who knows we might have even moved out into the cosmos by god's direct assistance hard to say space is vast who knows what god would have had for us to do in this creation what do i know we exchanged paradise that was from God for having it our way, and then we spent the last 4,000 years since the fall fantasizing that we can have paradise, doing it our way instead of doing it his way. That doesn't work. And it's been breaking down and corrupt and rotting because we introduced breaking down and rottenness and corruption. And that's the way it has been. And yet at the same time, in pursuit of his dream, because he still has this dream of us being in fellowship with him. And he's not going to give up on us. He didn't want to give up on us. And so in love, in pursuit of that dream, God built up a people. That is to say, built up Israel, right? From one man, he built a nation. And he gave them the law and an identity with him. And he showed them just by giving them the law. Oh yeah, I'll give you a law and let's watch how well you can't actually keep that. And you know what? God gives us rules. The first thing we discover in our fallen state in particular, we're not going to keep those. And they learn that. And then having learned brutally just how badly we fall short of his laws and his right and wrong, he then does something in the prophets. He promises that he would come and he would fix their sinful hearts and your sinful heart and my sinful heart. He would come and make a way to where all of a sudden we would not wander like we used to. And then he would also make a way where he would remember their sins no more. It took 4,000 years in pursuit of recapturing that dream. That's the time from the fall to the birth of Jesus Christ. And in the pursuit of his dream of fellowship with you and me, God Almighty at the right time then became a human being to make that fix 
for us possible. A fresh start. A new first person. In Adam all die. All become corrupt. Sin comes to all of us. So also in Christ all can be made alive. And he was born. He was born a human being. Born of a virgin. Born not from the natural way that people are begotten. Why? Because sin seems to be a hereditary problem. He was born sinless. He who has no sin so that he could take our sin and die for it. Because he loves you. And because he loves me. And he announced his birth through angels to shepherds and through signs and revelations we do not fully understand to the Magi. That the whole world, both those from his people and those from outside of his people, that they would all know, that they would all understand that being born right now is the Savior and the one who will make that fresh start possible. And after spending around 30 years teaching us and showing us the truth and healing us, in pursuit of that dream of fellowship, that one who was born died on the cross to save you died on the cross to save me. To pay for your sins, to pay for my sins, and to give us that hope that one day, after this world is over, if we live to see the end of it, we will see it come down. If we die, he will raise us to new life. But our sin will be totally and completely done with at that point. Between now and then, we struggle with sin, and yet we have the Holy Spirit who helps us to not sin, and we have his constant forgiveness. And so we have fellowship with him and we have the fundamental beginning of that now in having our fellowship with him, even as we see him only dimly. But one day I will meet him who was born in the manger or born in the stable and laid in the manger. I will meet him face to face and I will see his love. And I hope to be able to give him a big embrace and say thank you for that love and thank you for getting me through this very strange place every step of the way. No, people don't progress. We don't get better on our own. We just go round and round the tree while we sink deeper and deeper and decay. And unchecked, this world is going to more or less destroy itself because we will destroy each other. It'll come close to that, but God will intervene and then he will stop it and judge all things. People do not progress but Jesus was born to bring you and me to a better goal, which is not a better goal than what we started with, but which is bringing us back to what we were made to be. Forgiven of sin, spotless, and living in love and in fellowship with him and with one another. And that's no fantasy, that's a great hope. And I will tell you this, Tonight, if you are cut off from your family, if you are cut off from your traditions, if you're not able to do what you're used to, I'm with you. But if you are in Christ Jesus tonight, you are living in the culmination of 6,000 years. It's been 2,000 years more or less since Jesus' birth. So, you know, around 6,000 years of God's dream unfolding. 6,000 years Biblically speaking, since the start of it all, God's dream is unfolding, and that dream is that you could be his for always and that he could be yours for always. And if there's loneliness and a sense of emptiness at what you don't have because of the traditional things and people you'd love to be with, realize the great wonder that he has filled in giving you himself. And live in the great wonder that he has given you in giving you himself and forgiving your sins and making you his. And while you find yourself, if you find yourself cut off and wishing things were different, I will tell you this. I don't understand what 2020 has been and I don't understand what 2021 will be. I think that probably one day when the Lord brings us to that better place, we will look back on all of this and wonder just how unreal it all was. But in the midst of this unreality that we have to live in and walk through, every time that you find yourself feeling alone and feeling the decay of it all crushing in, 
every time you wince at the insanity of people swearing that this time we will make a brighter tomorrow on our own. God has managed, of course, to turn things around time and again and push things back time and again, but it's really only been by the mercy and grace of God. But when you find all of this crushing in, let me remind you of this promise that's true now and true beyond now. Every time that you find yourself alone, we misquote this verse. We use this verse as an evangelistic tool, but this is a verse given to God's church and given to his people, and so I give it to you now. Jesus' words to his church, here I am. Feeling lonely, feeling cut off, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. I am here. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me and we will have fellowship. Every time that you need him, he is there. Really. Look to his word. Turn to him in prayer. And realize and trust the fact that if you will simply prayerfully give him the time, spend time in the word, he is there with you. You will be in fellowship with him. If your feelings don't perfectly line up with that, give them time. Feelings are incredibly volatile. But even if you don't feel his presence, he is there because he keeps his word. Live in that promise. Be comforted in that great promise. Merry Christmas. It's more than a beautiful story. It's his beautiful reality for you. Jesus Christ born, God Almighty become a human being, born to live, to die, to save and forgive you, to raise you to new life in him. Live in the gift of his presence and celebrate it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us and thank you that you have continued to reach out to us and to keep us. Lord, I pray for each heart that might be feeling a little hollow and a little empty, that you would help us to receive your love, to remember your love, and to turn to you and your love and say thank you. Thank you for being born for me. Thank you for living in me. Lord, help us to receive that love and, and in thankfulness then to receive and to speak back those words such that it warms us up. Thaw our, our hard and cold hearts and speak your grace into our cold days. Thank you that you have got us through this year. Thank you that you're already with us in the next year. But thank you that at this time where we slow down and ponder the amazingness of the fact that you became one of us. Thank you for this great mystery that is ours, a Savior born to save us, and that in you we can and we will be made alive. We pray this in your name, quite thankfully, Lord Jesus. Amen. I would encourage you at this point, hopefully you've been singing along with the hymns anyway, but especially at this point I would encourage you to bring your lights down, to have some candles lit, and to really spend some time. You'd have been in a candlelight service as much as possible. This is meant to be your candlelight service at home. So we continue with the distribution of candlelight and the hymns. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is Joy to the World, and I would encourage you to enjoy whatever mood you have set in your house and maybe have further music on as, as appropriate beyond this, or however you go on to celebrate it, but celebrate it knowing the great joy that is ours because Jesus Christ was born to save us and the great joy that will be ours when Jesus Christ comes back to take us to be with him. Joy to the world. Merry Christmas. God bless. Say